Go ahead, Julia. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We've got um, our host of this Facebook Live slash Zoom Town Hall, Senator Barbara Favola. And joining Senator Favola, we have Senator Boisco and Senator Bell. Um, Senator Favola, would you like to give a quick intro? Um, sure, thank you, Julia. First, I, I just wanna thank my esteemed colleagues. It is really an honor and a pleasure to work with both of you. You are very dedicated and very, very able and effective public servants. Um, this is a challenging time and we feel that communicating as much as possible with our constituents is a good thing. Uh, all of us are getting questions. All of us are, are feeling the, um, the stress that's out there. And we want you to know that um, has elected officials, we are here for you. We're here to help you. And we are all in this together. Uh, today is the first day of the National Nurses Awareness Week, so I hope we've posted some nice comments about nurses. It is a whole week and will end on May 12th, which happens to be um, Florence Nightingale's birthday. Uh, and to that point, we have the greatest respect and admiration, all of us, for the wonderful healthcare workers who are risking their health and safety and the health and safety of their loved ones uh, to serve us. And we so much appreciate it. You are our true heroes. We also appreciate all those essential workers who are making it possible for us to, to, uh, to have some kind of normal life. Those who are driving delivery trucks and stocking our grocery shelves and, uh, and uh, picking up our uh, waste and garbage. There's so many essential workers that are necessary to our day-to-day -day, uh, fabric, um, uh, living fabric, and we thank you very much and, um, and certainly are advocating on your behalf as well. Uh, and I uh, will turn the um, program over to my two colleagues. I can know it, it, we'll start getting into the actual meat of the program. I know we've been asked to cover some issues related to special elections. We've been asked to cover uh, issues related to facilitating elections in general when we go forward for November. And then of course, there are some other topics we may wanna cover and I would like my colleagues to have a chance at least by the end of the program to wrap up on the good things they've done. And I'd like to talk about um, my legislative session as well. So that's how the program will run. And um, I will turn it back to our moderator. Julia, go ahead. Thank you. Senator Boisco, did you want to start us off with um, a recap of legislation that was passed this session with regard to voting in the elections? Sure, I'd be happy to. We have a lot of good news on that front. Um, after years and years of putting forth bills that would expand access to um, to the polls and making it easier for people to vote and having them shut down. This year, we had, I believe, something like 12 initiatives that uh, were passed and the governor has signed that will either go into effect this year or next year. Um, so I'll just go through a quick review of those. Um, first, um, we have passed a bill, SB 601, that um, makes election day a state holiday um, and removes Lee Jackson Day as a holiday. Um, and that will be the Tuesday after the first Monday in November every single year. Um, we have expanded absentee voting, specifically no excuse absentee voting. So any person can come and um, apply for an absentee ballot without having to give an excuse. Um, that will start in July. So right now, if you're voting in a special election for your town, for these town elections, you would still put um, illness on there. I think it's 2A. Yes. Um, we now have, uh, through the DMV, automatic voter registration ability. So when you go to the DMV, um, you will be able to automatically apply for uh, voter registration. We also have a uh, same day voter registration that has been passed, HB 201. Um, that is a delayed effect until 2022. So it won't be in effect for this coming election year, but still an amazing thing. Number five, this will be in effect this year on July, 2020. 
repeals the strict photo ID requirements. And I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail about that because it's something that so many of us have worked hard on and it really will make a difference for a lot of people. So you will be able to show a driver's license, a valid passport, any other identification issued by the Commonwealth or its political subdivisions or the United States, any student identification card in um, higher education in the Commonwealth in a private school or in a school outside of Virginia. You will be able to use um, um, a valid employee identification card. Um, you will be able to use a copy of a current utility bill, a bank statement, a government check, a paycheck, a government document that shows the name and the address of the voter. It also provides that an expiration date on a driver's license is not considered any longer when determining the, the, a valid driver's license offered as, as ID. And um, a voter who does not show one of these required forms of identification when offering to vote is going to be required to sign a statement saying that he is the named registered voter that he claims to be in order to be permitted to cast a ballot. And um, of course, that ballot that, that signed is subject to felony of penalties for making a false statement and is punishable by a class five felony. So you have to be honest with that. But this is something that we've been working for for a long time. And I think it's gonna help, especially folks who have not gotten access to a driver's license, especially a lot of our elderly folks, it's gonna be good for them. And then let's go on to the other things that we've gotten. Um, we will be extending the polling hours on election dates from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. now. Um, that won't go into effect until 2021. Um, we will now allow for a permanent vote by mail absentee voting so that you can, uh, you can identify yourself as someone who plans to vote absentee consistently throughout and you will receive an absentee ballot without having to make the application. That will not go into effect until next year. Absentee voting, emergency voting, which says that there is going to be a process for um, voting absentee when an emergency um, keeps you from being able to get there um, on election day. Um, that's Mark Sickles, who has been working on that issue for a long time, got that passed. Um, the commissioner of elections can take administrative action to facilitate absentee voting for those people who are having an emergency situation. And in starting in, tw that's 2020, in that's 2020, um, but in 2021, we will have prepaid return postage for absentee ballots. Um, we will have um, absent, um, all ballots postmarked on or before election day to be counted up to three days after election, and that will go into effect this year. Um, it, there was something that will also um, extend the deadline for the returned absence, absentee ballots um, before noon on the third day of the postmark. Um, we will now require election um, material to be uh, provided in multiple languages and regions where we know there are several uh, large volumes of folks who speak other languages. Fairfax County will be the recipient of one of those, I know for certain. Um, and then, um, of course, we're looking at the redistricting um, and um, the constitutional amendment will be up. Um, I actually had a bill that will um, modernize the way a notice, notification of denial will be made. Currently, you have to be um, notified if your application is going to be denied by postal mail. This will allow you to provide your, your phone number and or your email and allow a registrar to reach out to you directly through those methods if you so wish. Um, so we have a lot going on and a lot of success and we're still working on some things for this year. I know that the Attorney General has made some, some, some statements and looking forward to getting a lot of that um, resolved, but I think we have a lot to be uh, celebrating. So thank you. Back to you, Julia. Thank you, Senator Boisco. Senator Bell, 
Is there any other info regarding city and town elections on May 19th or June 4th that you'd like to share? Let me have on mute. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. A couple things uh, I want to add as well, uh, if I could. I put two links out on the chat and I would encourage people to take a look at that. The first one I think is a very, very good website uh, from the Virginia Department of Health. A lot of COVID-19 information, Q&As, helpful things. And the second one is a link to the uh, governor's webpage and it gives information on executive orders and updates. So pertinent to your question, uh, the governor did move back the May 4th elections to May 19th. There are several localities who petitioned to go to the Supreme Court and have moved those back to June 4th. Uh, but you can find information on uh, both of those, um, of, of those sites that I just gave you about that information. Um, I can tell you that uh, a great deal of precaution is being taken. The Virginia Board of Elections was working on this prior to the governor's uh, executive order and the General Assembly veto session. Uh, and we, you know, we discussed this in great detail. Uh, originally, the, uh, the governor was going to move back the elections to November. Uh, the General Assembly talked about it and ultimately decided not to, to do that. Uh, it was a difficult decision. Uh, and frankly, there were people on both sides of this issue. Um, one of the issues was people had already campaigned and many absentee vote votes had been placed. And if we were to move the elections to November, those votes would have spoiled and not been counted. And uh, candidates who had spent a lot of time, frankly, their time uh, would could have been considered a waste. Um, but as I said, people were on both sides of this issue uh, and it, it was a tough one. Um, I believe we should do first, we should put safety first. Uh, and, and I encourage everyone, if they can vote absentee or to do the mail-in, please do that. Uh, if you do go to decide to vote, uh, please follow the uh, social distancing rules and guidelines. There'll be, uh, the Board of Elections again is working on safety measures. There'll be clear marks on the ground. They'll have different lines. They've actually gotten a lot of volunteers uh, available to uh, help people. Uh, to clean and sanitize frequently, and to also make sure that we follow those safety precautions. So uh, wear your protective gear, wear your uh, a mask, uh, a face covering. Uh, I would encourage you, if you have gloves, to wear them. Uh, please, uh, you know, again, even though I know our social uh, customs are to shake hands, hug, et cetera, refrain from that, uh, maintain distance, and, uh, and please, you know, go in, and, and I would encourage you to, to try to, to do it in the safest way possible. Uh, the more we can do early voting, if you want to vote in person, uh, there should be some, some um, uh, plenty of locations available to do that. And the, again, that's another way of going where there won't be a crowd. Uh, happy to answer any questions about uh, that. The last thing I wanted to just say, the General Assembly session this year, while I know we're focused on voting today, it was really a monumental session. Uh, we know that we're, we're not going to be able to implement some things right away. We want to due to funding issues. Uh, right now, frankly, we don't know what we don't know. But we do know our economy is, is definitely not performing the way it normally would. And we're going to have to reassess that once we have better information. So uh, at the moment, the smart decision uh, that the governor made and the General Assembly agreed, uh, which is tough because there's many things we'd like to do now, uh, we've agreed to hold those off until we know more about what the funding is at. Uh, having said that, we passed historic legislation. Uh, we ratified the, uh, the ERA here in Virginia. I think that's, you know, frankly, a great thing that I'm so proud of, uh, proud to be with my colleagues to vote on that. Uh, we also did some great legislation to prevent gun violence, um, and, and I think we'll make great strides on that. I was proud of a bill I was able to get passed that requires in-person training for concealed carry permits. Uh, I've done that five years in a row. Many of these pieces, as uh, Senator Boyce was said, we've worked on for years, and it was really uh, a tremendous thing, and I think it's going to save lives. We passed very important anti-discrimination legislation. We raised the minimum wage. Unfortunately, we can't put that into effect as quick as we wanted to, but we will still do that. We'll make sure people here make enough money to uh, provide for their families. We did a number of very important worker protections this year, uh, which I think will make sure that workers in Virginia get treated fairly. Uh, we want Virginia to be the pl best place for, for businesses, but also the best place for workers and the best place for people to live. And I think we focused on a very well-rounded um, uh, portfolio to include many different pieces of legislation that will help us in our environment and be more uh, uh, green in our production of energy going forward. So with that said, uh, be happy to answer your questions and look forward to them. 
Uh, I will turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you, Senator Bell. Senator Favola, is there anything else that you'd like to add on the elections topic? Um, thank you, Julia. I was just checking the questions that have come in from the chat room, so I will try to respond to some of them. Uh, one of the questions was the Attorney General made a determination for the June 23rd primary that no witness signature would be needed on the absentee ballot. Uh, is that decision applicable to other elections? And the answer is no. That court decision dealt with only the June 23rd primary. So uh, a witness signature is still needed for absentee ballots. For the May 19th election, you have to have asked for your absentee ballot by May 12th. If you don't have uh, the opportunity or access to a person who can witness your signature, call the Loudoun Democratic Committee and volunteers would be available to come out and, uh, and witness your signature for you. Um, the other question, one of the questions came in on the mail-in voting and where are we on that discussion. And I will say that our Department of Elections, and I've had a, a couple of Zoom meetings now one was with the De Deputy Commissioner, Jessica Bowman. And what we're learning is 21 other states have uh, some form of mail-in voting for, for their elections. Um, where we would head in Virginia is down the path of probably a, a joint mail-in as well as the option for some select in-person voting stations to be open. So it would be not an either or, it would be an and, hopefully with a lot of emphasis on the mail-in option. Uh, again, I expect there would have to be some witness statement that would be expected from a voter. We'd want to try to ensure um, the validity of the ballot. But our goal here and our goal for our constituents is to make voting easy and accessible. Um, there is no, there really is no problem in fraud in this country in voting. And it's less than uh, three tenths of a percent. And a recent study done by the Brennan uh, Justice Center. So, um, so the arguments we had heard for years, uh, mainly from the other side of the aisle, that there was some, you know, we had to come up with a photo identification and a lot of hoops for people to vote based on, uh, voter fraud, simply those arguments were simply not founded. So we have to do what we can to really encourage democracy. When we all vote, we all feel an ownership in our government. We all then have a truly participatory democracy. And I believe we have a government that becomes more accountable and more responsive. So that's our overall uh, priority when it comes to voting. And we're going to continue to work diligently. And I think Senator Boisco mentioned this, Senator Bell alluded to this. We're going to work diligently to, uh, to achieve that general goal I just talked about. And we've made transformational progress this past session. Um, the other things that have come up, you know, the Clean Economy Act was referred to, and that's definitely one of our major, major successes. Um, under the Clean Economy Act, we will be with renewable energy and no carbon emissions, no net carbon emissions by 2045, which is a phenomenal goal. Uh, we've managed to get buy-in from all the sectors, business, um, of various industries, the environmental groups, and of course the utilities. So we think that that's, that's really going to move us forward. I have a small piece of that with uh, Delegate Reed and passing an energy plan. Um, Senator McClellan and others worked on, I'm sure everybody on this, this uh, Zoom meeting worked on getting the, the larger bill passed. It was quite an effort, but I'm so proud. And, um, and I, I do want to thank all of you who wrote in and, and helped advocate for the Clean Economy Act. Um, and we've, we still have work to do. I know my paid family leave did not pass, and I'm hoping that next year we'll go back at it. And Senator Boisco has been working on a paid medical leave bill. So um, one thing the COVID-19 crisis has shown us is just how 
important it is to ensure that everybody in our economy is safe so they can uh, contribute in, in a meaningful way. And part of that safety is in fact, being able to take time off when you're sick to care for yourself and to care for your children and your family members. Um, the, I will just conclude by saying after uh, the many lawmakers have tried for many years, but I managed to get through a no surprise billing bill, which was phenomenal. So now you will not receive a surprise medical bill when you happen to go to an emergency room or get a procedure out of network. And that took some doing because um, it is not easy to work with the insurance industry by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and of course, I also had the hospitals and the doctors and, and other advocacy groups in the room, but it was a continual uh, heavy duty four week effort of every of meetings every day with these stakeholders. Um, and I and I did have a bill that promoted telemedicine, which has been proving to be a very useful tool right now and um, and and we're pleased. I think the governor has been very nimble in um, in addressing COVID-19. We are fortunate. He is a medical doctor. He very much is making his decisions based on science. And, um, and we're going to, we're all in this together. We're going to, to, I think, slowly move out of this phase we're in and enter a new phase, but we will have to continue to do social distancing. Uh, remember to wash our hands, wear our face masks when we're out and um, and really be diligent if we're going to try to get back to some um, some kind of normalcy. But uh, thank you to all of you who are doing your part and will continue to do, do your part to keep us healthy and um, and to enable a few of our businesses to open. Thank you, Senator Favola. We received a number of questions ahead of time through email, so we're going to get through those quickly okay. and then um, hopefully have some time to move on to these live questions. Okay. And so the first question that came through on email asks, has the deadline to request an absentee ballot been moved back to accommodate the new May 19th elections? And um, any senator I have Ooh, the May 19th election, I have the deadline as 5, uh, 5 p.m. Tuesday, May 12th for the May 19th election. Thank so you, that, Senator you know, I just want to reiterate, Senator Bell mentioned or uh, alluded to this that only a few towns in Loudoun are under the May 19th election. There was a, a lawsuit taken by um, Lovettsville, Middleburg, and Percival asking that the May 19th election be pushed back. And for those three jurisdictions, it has been pushed back to June 4th. Yeah, the other thing, if I could add one thing to that, people could also apply for ballots online for the June 4th election. The deadline is May 28th. Thank you. We had another question about the May 19th elections. So um, what is the next step in the process if the May 19th elections are deemed to be unsafe to move forward? What are the factors that would determine such a thing? Um, I, I will start off, and my colleagues can certainly add to this. Um, based on medical models that the governor and his task force are examining now, um, there does not seem to be at this point any indication that the COVID-19 situation will get worse. We're expecting the COVID-19 situation to be more contained and enable us to perhaps um, control the, the spread more effectively. The governor's plan is to test as many as 10,000 individuals a day and to do contact tracing. Actually, the state is looking to hire a thousand people and train them to do contact tracing. So as we implement those steps, we're going to be able to identify more effectively the actual pool of people who are either carrying COVID-19 unknowingly or have COVID-19 and have not come in to be tested. And then we can start the, you know, the treatment or the self-isolation that we would ask them to do. So if we can, can 
continue on this trajectory. We're expecting the May 19th election um, cycle to be no worse than where we are now. Um, the state will be issuing guidelines to the various registrars to ensure that public health measures will be taken. And in fact, the medical corps will be, the Virginia medical corps will be dispersed to every uh, voting site to make sure that sanitation is being done properly and, and volunteers are wearing masks and, um, and keeping equipment clean. And of course, we're gonna be asking voters to, to practice social distancing. I just want to reiterate what Senator Bell said, voting absentee ballot is a really good thing to do right now. That is the best option. It is your safest option. So we're really, we really want to encourage you to vote absentee. So there'll be very few people who, are, who will be going into the actual election stations for the May elections. Thank you, Senator Favola. And we have a few questions who um, they have asked specific senators to answer. So let's try to get through some of those. Um, Senator Boisco, given the known problems with mailing ballot, mail-in ballots, what actions will be taken to ensure election integrity? There has been, um, you know, absentee ballot process in Virginia for years. There, I'm not aware of a significant um, problem with voter integrity through our, our process right now. Uh, people are under penalty. You know, they are, they, they are risking a class five felony if there is an incident of voter fraud, which we have found some very tiny incidents of it. I've served on the Privileges and Elections Committee for the majority of the time that I've been in office. And we, we did a really deep dive into this a couple of years ago when I was in the House of Delegates, where we looked at the incidences historically and currently, and we did not find any discernible um, problem with voter fraud or voter integrity. And so I, I, I think that we have a safe system in place. Thank you, Senator Boisco. Senator Bell, one of your constituents asked, do we currently have the infrastructure for wide scale voting by mail um, and overall process in place? Uh, will we have that infrastructure in place for the June elections or even by November? Uh, great question. Uh, the, the answer is yes, we do. Uh, and frankly, uh, when we have uh, uh, mail in ballots, they're actually uh, tabulated and counted by the same machines if you go in person the election officials uh, open them up and they put them right through the same machines. Uh, so we're using you know, much of the same technology. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, you can go to BPAP or Board of Virginia Board of Elections websites and you can see on those that the number of uh, mail-in ballots have actually increased dramatically over the last couple of years. Yeah. More and more people are using them. So we, we have a, a huge amount of people who decided to, to vote that way. And uh, it allows, you know, again, many people with, with challenged schedules or difficult travel, uh, the ability to vote. And uh, I, I believe we, we can absolutely execute that. And I can tell you again, the Board of Elections uh, are taking uh, many actions to make sure things are safe and to be prepared for increased uh, absentee ballots. So, so these are things that we have thought about. Uh, the last thing I'll add is, is um, uh, kind of piggybacking on what Senator Favola said, uh, COVID-19 is challenging. Uh, this is a tough virus, and this has been a very fluid situation. Uh, you know, we have a, a good team. Our governor, uh, being a physician, certainly helps, and we've got a great group of people uh, looking at all the best available data. And uh, we may have to change what the plan is today if things, you know, evolve in a bad way. But uh, realize that, uh, you know, we, we are watching this, and we know that we have people looking at it very carefully, and we, you know, we will put safety first. But to answer your question, I believe absolutely we have uh, the ability and the, the productions in place to, to handle increased volume. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Senator Bell. Senator Favola, you received several emails from your constituents in both Arlington and Fairfax. Um, I think there's some confusion given the news coming out about new election dates. So could you just let your constituents know 
who um, in Arlington might be running in May or, or what, um, what's going on with elections in May? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Julia. That, that's a fair question. We have so many elections going on in May and they're going on in different parts of Northern Virginia, so I can understand the confusion. Um, in Arlington County, I'm sure many of you are aware, we really had a, a very sad and untimely death of our county board member, Eric Gutschel, 49 years old and, and died of uh, a brain tumor. It was just heart-wrenching. Uh, I was close to Eric. He was a true servant, uh, um, servant leader, and I am going to miss him terribly. And having said that, um, the uh, court, circuit court, um, where we are, where we're in uh, Arlington, circuit court governing Arlington, determined July 7th would be the special election date. By law, we have to nominate an individual 60 days before the special election date. So a nominee had to be in place by May 7th. So the Democratic Committee had about two weeks to actually orchestrate a nomination process. And that's going on now as we speak. And it is going on electronically within the Democratic Committee you know, the steering committee in Arlington, the Arlington Democratic Steering Committee, the precinct uh, chairs, and others who have uh, roles in the Democratic Party and the Democratic Committee in Arlington are voting. And we've been doing it um, electronically. It started at noon, May 5th. It will end at 7 p.m. this evening. And the um, nominee will be announced this evening. So maybe that's where the confusion is. Um, so that nominee will run in a July 7th special election, unless a, a lawsuit has been filed <laughs> to um, move the July 7th election. It, that lawsuit was filed um, by the county board and it will be heard by a panel of judges of the Virginia Supreme Court we don't know if the July 7th date will be moved, but right now that is the date for the special election in, uh, in Arlington. The other May dates, uh, again, related to the uh, towns and cities in Loudoun, and uh, some of them, again, are gonna be May 19th, and some are going to be June 4th. So I don't want to continue to talk to talk about the the, uh, the different elections. It might confuse people. I would advise voters in Loudoun to go to the Loudoun Registrar's website, and it will be clearly identified which town and which city will have a June 4th election and which will have a May 19th election, and when your absentee ballots must be requested by so they can be returned in time to be counted. Thank you, Senator Favola. And I think this next question can be um, answered by anyone here, um, but we did get several questions about the health of the United States Postal Office and what that means in terms of, um, you know, getting information out to voters and our elections going forward. I can allow, Senator Boisco wants to speak. I just want to say something, you know, the fundamental reasons that our federal government was set up, one of them was to deliver the mail. It is in our constitution that we have, that there is an obligation of the federal government to do so. I find it horrifying that this has become a political um, football. Um, and I mean, from getting delivery packages of important things to like you're talking about, this is, this is crucial and will be an enormous um, difficulty for many millions of people in Virginia if they do something that compromises the um, ability of the Postal Service to continue its operation. It's a, it's a huge, huge blow, and I can't believe that it's being turned into a political issue. So I don't, I mean, I don't have the answer to what we would do if somehow they dismantle it, and I'll defer back to Senator Favola, but. I, I just found it outrageous that this is even an issue. Um, if I can add on that, uh, first, um, you know, just thank you to the um, the postal workers 
uh, and uh, and so many essential workers, uh, of course, our healthcare providers who are just doing uh, unbelievable work to care for people and also to keep our economy and our society moving forward. Um, there, the Postal Service uh, has uh, has over six hundred thousand employees that are every day processing uh, and and frankly keeping the mail moving. Uh, they have not experienced any significant delays. Uh, they are have taken measures. They've uh, put additional uh, personal protective equipment across the network. They put uh, additional uh, uh, workplace uh, behaviors, which include social distancing, sanitizing, uh, and they've also uh, updated uh, many of their processes where people can do them from telework. They are much like we're doing this town hall right now. So, uh, but obviously you physically have to go out to deliver that mail. Uh, they're trying to do everything they can to, uh, to eliminate uh, contact or to, you know, put protective measures like plexiglass and the postal service, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I say, uh, I salute our postal service and I thank them for what they're doing and all the other essential providers who are, you know, frankly, keeping our, our stores shop, stocked with food and, and making deliveries and just doing everything that, that it takes to allow uh, others to to stay safe at home. So so thank you to everyone who's doing that. I I will um, I will just say that this is an area where we really do need the government to uh, ensure that the postal service has enough funding. Um, I know President Trump has talked about asking the postal service to raise rates three or four times what they're currently charging. Um, that is not helpful. There are other alternatives out there besides the U.S. Postal Service, but none has expansive or as reliable as the U.S. Postal Service. And we need to, this is part of who we are. The Postal Service connects us as Virginians and as Americans. And we need the Postal Service. It should be valued and it should be, and there should be an assurance that if they, whatever money they don't raise through their service, there's a, a appropriate appropriation to keep it going. We cannot have mail-in voting without a well-functioning U.S. Postal Service. And, uh, and that message, I think if we can deliver that repeatedly to our lawmakers in Congress, that would be helpful. Thank you, Senator Favola. Um, we have a number of questions here, some about elections and some not. Um, we have a number of people asking about antibody testing, um, when that might be made available and any other information that you'd like to share on that topic. Um, I, Senator Boisco wants to start. I'm happy to uh, add something. Okay, so antibody testing is currently available. I actually had to get a blood test this morning and ended up going to one of the local um, um, labs where they told me that they are doing antibody testing um, in person um, in all of their facilities. So that is a possibility. We have specific information, I believe, um, about that. Um, and Senator Favola, did you want to follow back up on that? I, I can follow back up. Um, if I can jump in real quick, sure. I just posted on the chat the link to the coronavirus testing sites. Right. So uh, if you have a question about where to go uh, for different types of tests, uh, they're, they're all over the place and, and they're frankly growing every day. So I'll, I'll uh, turn it back over to you. And I will just, I will just add really quickly that the, the antibody test is different than getting the COVID-19 test. And the antibody tests are not listed on that website. Um, so don't get confused about that, but. Right, I, I mean, uh, and there has been a big call for those who have developed the antibody to actually donate blood and um, for, for a lot of medical reasons. So, so if you have uh, received the test and you do have, you have developed antibodies, then uh, you know if you could donate blood, that would be an incredibly big help to our healthcare providers and to our friends and neighbors. Um, one thing scientists tell us they don't they don't know um, how long the antibodies really how long the antibodies 
stay in your body, which is interesting because this is a very different kind of virus. And I always thought the antibody would always stay with you. Um, but that's not, that has not been confirmed yet. So uh, it's, chances are it'll stay for a couple of weeks, but it may not always be with you. So, so those who have had COVID-19, I wouldn't necessarily jump to the conclusion that six months down the road, you couldn't contract it again. So that, that's what scientists are telling us on the different websites right now. Thank you, Senators. Our next question comes in from our Q&A box. It's about um, the witness signature requirement. So the witness signature requirement for absentee by mail has been waived for the June 23 primary as a result of a lawsuit. Can we get that requirement eliminated for the November election? Um, well, I think, I think the three senators on this, on this call will be putting in some reform legislation for the special session, which I believe we're going to have maybe early September, um, when we have a better picture of the COVID-19 crisis, the fiscal impact of COVID-19 on our budget, the dollars we've received from the federal government, and then steps we need to take for the, for the November election. Um, I mean, I, for one, would like to eliminate that second signature and maybe require uh, a statement from the voter uh, under penalty of, um, um, you know, a, 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 a Act 5 felony or some, some you know, appropriate penalty. Um, I think a sworn statement or something would be, would be preferable to having folks go out and get a second signature, especially under conditions that I think are going to continue for some time. And we are going to have to do social distancing for a while. And, uh, and I don't know how long, because again, we're going to make our decisions based on science, but we don't have a vaccine yet. And, um, and I don't expect we're going to have a vaccine by November. So the barriers of getting a second signature in November will be with us. And I, and I would like to find a way to eliminate that second signature. Can I, can I jump in here? Just, I just want to say thanks to the advocates who are, many of you all are on this call today, who really have been doing a lot of the legwork to help figure out possible solutions. I'm gonna say especially thanks to John Farrell and Steve Spitz, who have really been working tirelessly on a lot of these electoral um, issues, not only right now, but in the long term. I mean, really appreciate your expertise and your diligence on these things to help make sure that voting is accessible and safe and, and, um, and that you know, most people are, who are legally able to vote are able to vote, so thank you. Thank you, Senators. Um, we have some questions regarding the reopening um, for business next Friday on May the 15th. Um, Senators, do you have any comments or thoughts on um, you know, whether we'll be safe to do that on Friday? Uh, if you want me to go first. Um, that's all right. Um, first, I would uh, encourage people to look at the link uh, to the governor's website, which gives uh, detailed information about his statement on reopening. Uh, it's three phases, and phase one is really what we're talking about now. Um, and and it, I should also say the governor says in a statement, and he's made this very clear, um, kind of restating what I said earlier, this is a fluid situation. Uh, COVID-19 is, is complicated. Uh, and the more we, we learn, the more we find we don't know as things change. So. Uh, the governor made it clear uh, he, he could change this. He could push this back. We could take a different path. Right. Uh, because if we find that, that it's not safe to, to proceed with phase one, he'll hold it back. And that's the right decision. Again, I think we have to take a first do no harm. And, uh, and frankly, if we were to open too soon and do it too aggressively, and I know there's people with, with very passionate opinions on both sides of this issue, but if we were to open uh, too quickly, uh, something obviously we all want to get back to normal, uh, then we could end up going through two or three more quarantine periods, uh, not to mention putting people's lives at risk. So uh, I think it's important to do this in, in a responsible way. So the governor gives pretty, pretty um, detailed indications of what to do or guidance on that. Uh, he's easing the limits on uh, some business and faith communities uh, and, and 
basically trying to, to uh, help them to function more carefully, uh, taking away the ban of 10 people, but still requiring social distancing be in place, uh, giving guidelines where they could, restaurants could operate, but not with the same seating capacity and without the same spacing that they probably had before. Uh, so, so there's precautions in this, and, and I think it's a responsible uh, path to move forward. But again, I, I will, will again rephrase that the governor is looking very closely at the data and reserves the right to change this if, if uh, we have a, a greater outbreak or if there's certain communities that may need to be on quarantine uh, longer because we wanna make sure that we do the right thing and we don't do something that's gonna put people at risk. I, I just wanna reiterate, uh, I think that was a great complete response, Senator Bell. And the governor has already shown uh, that he is very flexible on this. Uh, originally, we were going to open May 8th for uh, the phase one with businesses and we had not met certain criteria that the scientific community felt was necessary for us to meet. Uh, over in, in that criteria being a reduction in the number of identified cases that over a two week period and a reduction in the number of hospitalizations. So, so we are definitely trying to meet certain scientific uh, criteria that suggest allowing openings in a phased manner, still very much following uh, social distancing and some of the guidelines that uh, Senator Bell articulated. So um, what, what I do want to note, and I think the governor's right on this, he's looking at the state as a whole. He has not uh, gone down the path of uh, opening one region over another. And, and, I'm, and I have to commend him for that because what will happen is folks will travel <laughs> from, you know, a, a, a less restrictive region to one that is open and and that wouldn't help that doesn't help so treating the commonwealth as a whole i i, I think is a good thing thank you senators um we got a question about gun safety laws in virginia um can you summarize some of the main changes made in gun safety laws that happened during the past session um, well, Senator Boisco, you can start. I think you're on uh, Courts of Justice. Um, so you can start, and I think Senator Bell and myself, we can certainly fill in. Uh, we all worked on the gun safety measures. We were all very appreciative of the advocates who really helped us push those over the line. So I want to note we worked as a team, but I, Senator Boisco, why don't you start off? Absolutely. Yeah, so I think we all were co-sponsors on all of the bills. Um, we passed a background check, universal background check, closing the gun show loophole. Um, we passed one gun, handgun a month, reinstituted that. We um, passed a bill that would allow localities to make decisions for themselves if they wanted to limit where people could bring uh, guns into. We passed, um, um, and I might need you all to help me because I don't have the list in front of me. Um, we passed, um, we considered in the Senate an assault ban rifle uh, bill, but decided to continue that because it, it, there were so many um, complications to the definition of assault rifle that we felt we needed to further vet it. But we did pass um, what is known uh, commonly as a protective uh, risk order bill, which is also known as a red flag law that gets the, allows uh, um, someone to get the, a gun out of the hands of somebody who might be at risk of hurting themselves or others. Um, and um, getting, and then we passed another bill that would um, reduce the number of times a domestic uh, violence perpetrator would, would, um, would be found um, guilty before taking a gun out of their hands as well. I know Senator Bell had a, a couple of great uh, initiatives that were passed as well, but I think those were the big ones that we've really been working on for years and years. And of course, you all are aware that we went into a special session last summer where the governor asked us to consider all of those initiatives and without debate or a vote, um, we left without any action on those. And people around Virginia were outraged at that. Um, we believe that uh, 
you know, the Virginia voters and citizens want some reasonable uh, common sense um, things that will reduce gun violence in Virginia. We are sick and tired of opening up the paper and seeing that another school shooting has occurred or that, you know, someone else has lost their life. Um, in fact, yesterday there was a, a, an active shooter in Loudoun County. Luckily, no one was killed, um, but enough is enough. And so we feel, you know, that we did our due diligence. I was very proud to be on the courts committee to be a part of vetting those bills. And um, I think they're gonna stand up in court uh, if they are challenged. And I hope that it's gonna make Virginia a safer place for everyone. Yeah, I'll just say I think Senator Boyce did a great job of, of going through those. I can tell you that the debate and deliberation was intense. Uh, we looked at these very, very carefully. Uh, many of the, uh, the bills did not end up in the same form that they started, and that was because you know, of good discussions on it. Uh, you know, we, one example I can give you is on the extreme uh, risk protection orders, the uh, red flag laws. Uh, this is one we looked at, and uh, frankly, we discussed uh, it, what would happen if a search was done if someone was deemed to be uh, extreme risk, and a search found uh, some sort of an illegal substance that didn't belong to that person. Uh, and we were concerned about a Fourth Amendment uh, violation. Uh, so in the Senate, we changed that bill. Now, many people don't like that change, but frankly, you know, we, we, we swore an oath to the Constitution. And we debated about this uh, and decided that that was the, the action we had to take, and that's what we did. Um, as I said earlier, I did a bill on uh, requiring in-person handgun training. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a retired military officer. I served for 26 years. Uh, I'm a gun owner today. Uh, I've served in combat zones. I've had a gun on my hip for six months at a time. And I was extensively trained in how to use a handgun. And, and uh, I think it's important if you have a concealed carry permit uh, if you're able to uh, hide a weapon underneath a jacket, a coat, et cetera, that, that we know that you know how to properly use and safe that weapon. And uh, online or video training were the most common methods used. Very few people were using in-person training. And the online, actually some of them are 20 minutes total with only as little as five to six minutes of actual training. And I find that inc incredibly inadequate. Uh, and that training, frankly, is generic. It's not specific to the type of handgun a person would have. Uh, I believe the only way that you can be properly trained is to do in-person training. Uh, we did amend this bill a bit, and I, I think we took a very reasonable measured approach. We backed it off uh, a, another uh, year from when we were gonna start it so that training facilities would have the ability to adapt mm -hmm. and to, to make it uh, you know, where everyone could access training. Uh, we were pretty reasonable. We did put a number of hours or other things into the training because we wanted to, uh, we respect many of the, the uh, providers of training and, and we wanted to make sure that, you know, we respected their knowledge and their ability. So we tried to take a measured approach on this, but again, to make sure that we're protecting everyone uh, and, and doing this in a responsible way. Uh, Jennifer, a matter of fact, I think uh, Senator Favola and um, Senator Boisco were with me and uh, part of the, uh, the, the um, Safe Virginia Initiative, which we worked on for an entire year. Uh, I was the chair of the Northern Virginia uh, effort for this. Uh, we traveled all around the Commonwealth. We looked at gun violence. I will tell you, gun violence is not the same in Northern Virginia as it is in rural Virginia or uh, Richmond, Virginia. It's different. And, uh, and we, we, our package of bills we looked at and we passed this year was in response to trying to, uh, to really take a different path so we don't have another Virginia Tech, so we don't have another Virginia Beach, uh, that we don't just say, you know, oh, wow, there's another shooting today, that we, we take action. And as, uh, as Senator Boyce was said, you know, we, we looked at the data and, and doing nothing was not an option. And we, we feel the voters spoke and had a loud mandate. And I'm very proud of the actions we took. I, I just want to say my colleagues did a great job in summarizing things. I was very proud of the fact, and this bill went through my committee, I chair rehab and social services. We now have a law on the books which requires that um, firearms be locked and separated from the ammunition in all of our licensed child care centers and day, child day homes. Um, so this is a common sense example. This bill should have passed years ago. We're talking about child care centers. 
Um, and it, it took a change in, in lawmakers. Um, these bills would not have passed if the Democrats had not uh, gained enough seats to get into the majority in both the House and the Senate. So elections matter, and, um, and, we, and we need to keep working to get good people elected so our values are reflected in Richmond. Thank you, Senators. And in the three minutes remaining, um, so I'd like a, to- There's a, uh, Julia, a young woman uh, uh, has raised her hand and has kept it raised for quite a while. Um, is it uh, Ms. Corp? Is it? Um, I was just hoping we could get, I, I do want to say we are committed to answering your questions. We will get back to you whether we can get to them live or not. Um, it's just a question of time, but I would like to, maybe we could get that one more question answered. Uh, are you talking I about believe Satish Kaur? Yes. I think he asked his question in the Q&A box oh, and okay. I tried to um, okay. incorporate that a little bit earlier. But um, senators, if you want to um, wrap up with, um, by highlighting anything that you want from this past session um, or any elections, questions or, um, you know, any, any closing words. So we, we've got about five minutes left. So you want to give us each two minutes? Is that, is that the, uh, the gay plan here? Well, I, I, um, I just want to say that in many respects, this um, last session was very transformational. Um, again, a lot of good things got done in areas that were needed in terms of income inequality. We worked on the minimum wage, we worked on the prevailing wage bills and worker protection, as Senator Bell mentioned. We, um, we worked on things that really mattered, gun safety, um, some health, health initiatives that improved access. And I just want to caution folks, although we did have to quote unquote unallot dollars for our biennium budget going forward because we're unaware of the real impact that COVID-19 is going to have in terms of impacting our families and our businesses. Um, the governor has been very judicious in saying, let's wait and see. Uh, just because some of the money has been unallotted doesn't mean we won't be able to put some money back into the budget to cover some real necessary services. We did expand um, you know, some Medicaid coverage. We did expand uh, dollars flowing to nursing homes this year. And we did expand uh, dollars paid to personal care assistance. And those stayed in the budget. Um, and I think we're committed to going back and looking at our budget after we get a really good picture of what the the federal financial aid will be to the state of Virginia, what we end up actually receiving, and then um, what our expenses really uh, turn out to be when it comes to the COVID-19. But I would, I would stay positive. I think the state is, is doing what it needs to do. We're dealing with the crisis in a rational way, and, and I, I'm hopeful we'll be able to get some of the resources that we had allocated when we left Richmond I'm hoping we'll be able to get them back into key places like increasing teacher salaries and, and other good things that we, we had allocated. So I wanted just to thank everybody for being on the call and for being active, for you know letting us know what's important to you. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't agree, but I you know think it's important that we have those conversations. Um, some of the things that I'm really proudest of that we passed this year were dealing with our immigrant community. I was the, I was the patron for the in-state tuition expansion to allow our dreamers to continue their education, getting in-state tuition, as well as working hard to expand who can have access to a driving credential here in Virginia. Um, for the immigrant population, these are enormously important issues and my community happens to be very, heavily uh, populated with uh, people from all over the world that we welcome and we are happy to have here. Um, we also didn't have a chance to talk about this, but we made in, inroads on um, expanding access to women's reproductive health care that we've been working on for years. 
Um, and one thing that Senator Favola touched on was paid family and medical leave. I've been carrying that bill for a few years. And I think the reason that people were not ready to talk about it yet was because they didn't realize what the costs are for not doing something about it. And so whether it's paid sick days or full paid family and medical leave, which is really more for someone who's had a child or suffering through a cancer or some other catastrophic um, episode in their life where they really need to be able to take care of their families, but still maintain some amount of income coming in. I think this COVID-19 epidemic has shown us why it's so important that we do think ahead and make investments into our workers so that they have some flexibility to take care of the things that they need. And I uh, intend to continue those conversations, but you all are imperative in this process. And I wanna thank you for your time and your interest and your commitment to making Virginia a better place for everyone. And of course, I appreciate my colleagues and um, love working with them every single day and our staffers. So thanks. Uh, I'll be very brief and just say thank you for the opportunity to serve you uh, in the Virginia Senate. It's, it's a true honor. Uh, thanks to uh, Senator Favola for hosting this uh, town hall, Senator Verboisco, my good friend. Uh, it was wonderful being part of this. Thanks to our moderator, Julia, you did a great job. And to everyone who, uh, who called in or typed in a question, I appreciate you giving up some time to join this. Uh, if we didn't hit your question, uh, all of us can be easily reached from our websites, Facebook pages, et cetera. My uh, website is senatorbell.com, uh, or you can find me on uh, Senator John Bell on Facebook. Uh, please let us know if you have any concerns or if we can do anything to serve you better. Uh, thank you, everyone, for following the guidance. Uh, ask that you please stay strong. Hopefully, yeah. we'll be through this soon. And uh, be kind to each other. Thank you so much. Great last words. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Wear your mask when you go out. <laughs>